Uh, today I'm going to be presenting uh, modeling the spread using machine learning. So uh, my name is Aaron Deprincat, and I am a student currently doing my master's degree in artificial intelligence at the University of Malta. Uh, also, I am currently a researcher at Hudson and Thames. Uh, my main interest is applying data sets, primarily used in finance. Um, these are my social links, if uh, you may have any questions or want to connect. So, so overview, uh, an overview of the presentation. So we'll, we'll start by discussing pros and cons of trading spreads. Then we'll introduce the research work of Dr. Tunis and co-authors. Following their work, we're going to discuss an assortment of models, mostly neural network-based architectures. Then we will discuss possible modeling techniques to improve out-of-sample results. And finally, we will tackle the question, is machine learning other than classical modeling methods? So why even trade spreads? So advantages-wise, so first, spreads are less likely to suffer from information shocks as the movements of the two legs will offset each other. The second is that uh, they're also less likely to be subject to speculative bubbles. Uh, Sweeney notes that uh, speculative bubbles are a big source of market inefficiency. This is less likely to happen in spread markets because any bubble effect will be replicated in the opposing leg, assuming the two legs are sufficiently correlated. Disadvantages wise, well, firstly, spreads are hard to trade uh, since, since they offer a limited return potential because of the muted effect of market inefficiencies. Uh, this is also exacerbated by the fact that two sets of transaction costs have to be covered in order to trade the spread. As just mentioned, uh, the second disadvantage is uh, transaction costs. A point made by uh, Butterworth and Holmes was that the overall profitability of a strategy is seriously impaired by the difficulty which traders face in liquidating their positions. This indicates a, a definite need for a more surgical trade selection strategy, uh, which here is solved using an assortment of filters. So uh, the following work is, is, is based on the research of uh, Dunas and co-authors. Uh, the, the, the work uh, are based on finding, finding profitable modeling techniques on major classical commodity spreads. Uh, these, these commodities are primarily traded on the futures markets. So an extra layer of complexity was added. The, the next step was evaluating a multitude of neural network based models and benchmarked against classical linear models. Throughout experimentations, the authors found that the profitability of the strategies they devised improved significantly through the use of simple filters, which decreased a significant amount of trades that were not covering their own transaction costs. This sparked an interest in evaluating other more complex filtering methods like correlation and volatility filters. So framework overview. So why these uh, neural networks? These were selected to evaluate the performance of increasingly complex network architectures against the classical fair value benchmark. Why use a, a regressor committee to tackle the variance bias problem? As Naftali in 1997, in his 1997 paper notes, an ensemble of models performs better that, than any individual model because the model's various errors will average out. Why use filters? Trades are expensive. The employment of filters is done to remove trades that, based on heuristics, have a high prob probability of making a profit 
that doesn't cover transaction costs. Uh, neural network architecture. So the first one is the generic multi-layer perceptron. It is, it's, it's built with at least three layers, comprising of an input, hidden, and output layer. Uh, the structure of the input layer is determined by the number of explanatory variables depicted as nodes in the architecture. Uh, the hidden layer represents the, com the capacity of complexity uh, in which the model can support or fit. Moreover, both the input and hidden layers contain what is known as a bias node. The value attributed to this node is a fixed value <coughs> and equal to one. It's purpose, its purpose is similar to the intercept in more traditional uh, regression models. The final layer is the output layer. It's governed by a structure of nodes corresponding to a number of response variables. Uh, recurrent neural networks are a type of networks which love Bridge the back propagation through time algorithm to determine gradients. Through this process, RNNs tend to run into two major problems known as exploding gradients and vanishing gradients. The long short term memory cell was first introduced by Hockreter and Schmidtuber as a solution to overcome these problems. Basically, an LSTM is capable of retaining and propagating information through the dynamics of the LSTM memory cell, hidden state, and gating mechanism. So higher order neural networks. As explained by Giles and Maxwell in 1987, uh, higher order networks exhibit adequate learning and storage capabilities you know, due to the fact that the order of the network can be structured in a manner which resembles the order of the problem. Although the extent of their use in finance has so far been limited, uh, Knowles et al. in their 2009 paper show that with shorter computational times and limited input variables, the best higher order networks show a model, uh, show a profit increase over the uh, standard uh, multi-layer perceptron over, over around 8%. Typically, higher order networks are split into two types. The first type uses feature engineering to expand the input data set to represent high or higher order relationships in the original data set. The second type uses a architectural modifications to augment the ability of the network to find higher order relations in the data set. So functional link neural networks are one type of single layer higher order networks. Basically, they consist of a number of input nodes and a single processing layer, which functionally expands the input space by pre-processing the inputs. The dimensionality of the input space for FLNs can be increased in basically two ways. The first way is cross products of the input terms are added to the original data set. For example, for a network with three inputs, x1, x2, and x3, second order terms would be three pairwise cross products. Third order, uh, third order terms can also be added. The second way involves using mathematical functions to transform the input data. Examples of these in literature consist of mostly of using polynomial series to expand the input terms. Due to the fact that the number of inputs can be numerous, orders of four and over are rarely used. So pi sigma neural network. So the term pi sigma comes from the fact that these networks use products of sums of input components. Gauche et al. 1992 paper introduced this network, which avoided the common exponential increase in the number of weights and processing units normally associated with higher order networks. The, the network structure consists of 
an input layer, a single hidden layer of linear summation inputs, and product units in the output layer. This network utilizes product cells as the output units to indirectly incorporate the capabilities of higher order networks. So regressing regressor voting committee. So combinations or ensembles of forecasts with equal weights have been shown to perform well and considered a successful way of hedging against the risk of selecting a misspecified model. A very recent affirmation of this approach was a paper that discussed the findings from the latest Makridakis forecasting competition results. The Makridakis for forecasting competition happens every few years. It basically enables researchers from all over the world to try and tackle large scale multivariate forecasting problems on data sets from multiple sectors, including finance. One of the key achievements of the M4 competition is that it confirmed that combining more than one forecasting method improved the final accuracy considerably. So, filters. So as, as mentioned, uh, as previously mentioned, the, the point made by Butterworth and Holmes uh, was that the overall prof pro profitability of the strategy is seriously impaired by the difficulty which traders face in liquidating their positions. So that indicates a need for a more discerning trade selection method. This is achieved by using a standard threshold, a correlation, and a volatility filter to further refine the various models' return risk characteristics. More encouragingly, in most cases, the application of a filter improves the results in terms of out-of-sample sharp ratio. So the standard filter. This standard filter is a very simple filter. It's basically setting a band, and whenever the predicted spread hits the upper or lower side, a short or buy trade is executed. In the current implementation, the value of the band threshold X is has been set in the training stage and kept through through the other stages. So correlation filter. So for this, the idea here is to enable the trader to filter out periods of static spread movement and, and retain periods of dynamic spread movement. By using this filter, it, it should also be possible to filter out initial moves away from fair value, which are generally harder to predict than moves back to fair value. Um, doing so also filters out periods when the spread is stagnant. So volatility filter. So the intuition of this filter is to basically avoid trading when volatility is very high, while at the same time exploiting days when the volatility is, very, is relatively low. The, the technique being used here to forecast volatility is called risk metrics. Uh, which can be seen as a special case of the Bollerslav uh, Garch model with predetermined decay parameters. So the estimation of volatility regimes is based on a rolling historical average of risk metrics volatility, as well as the standard deviation of this volatility. After the specification of the volatility regimes is done, Leverage ratios are set based on the above principle. High leverage in low volatility states, low to no leverage in high volatility states. So implemented workflow. So following Dunis's work, uh, the spreads modeled were the classical crack and crush spreads. Features wise, only five leg returns were used. Uniqueness sampling was employed to remove overlapping features. Another overfitting mitigation was used, which consisted of, consisted of setting a one-year embargo between the training validation set 
and the out of sample set. Also modeling wise, we try to stay as conservative as possible using the minimum amount of layers and also using area stopping. Results. So LSTM performed best while the higher order networks performed worst. But after further investigation of the predicted out of sample residuals, uh, suspicious prediction instances were found. Uh, for example, the crack spread, in the crack spread, the LSTM managed to predict an outlier, which was an exogenous political event that should have been impossible to predict. Thus, the predictions from the best performing models were thrown out due to obvious overfitting. The filters were still employed to the, on the higher order network predictions, uh, because after careful analysis of the residuals, we concluded that they didn't manage to predict any obvious anomalous outliers. Uh, the results of the standard filter were surprisingly consistently positive in terms of annual returns. Uh, the correlation filter had sporadic performance and suffered very large drawdowns. Um, the time varying leverage feature of the volatility filter improved annual returns substantially uh, when used on top of a standard filter. So intuition behind the current problem solving framework. So the current framework is as follows. Basically using increasingly complex algorithms with borderline random pseudo informative time series features to predict price action with no actual foundational hypothesis to support the outcome. This approach, at least in this implementation, did not work well. A, a better approach, in my opinion, is, that, is to try and predict specific anomalies where the interaction between the specific anomaly and price, preferably, is linear and intuitively causal. Uh, an example of this uh, is earnings surprises. So uh, with the benefit of foresight, you can see earnings announcements and their impact on price. You can also figure out that no amount of lagged returns or neural network layers would have been able to predict these movements. Yet these specific events have been shown in the literature of being relatively predictable. As an example here, this is a paper by Derek Snow published in 2017. Another example anomaly is credit valuation events. So uh, a, short, a short summary of credit ratings. Uh, the highest rating is AAA, lowest is C. Anything under double B is considered junk and anything above is considered investment grade. So significant events like dropping from investment grade to junk or vice versa, have a significant market impact as seen in the chart to the right. Now, ratings agencies announce periodically their independent ratings on the current credit state of corporates. It's been shown in the literature that these ratings are quite predictable. Using machine learning, the example paper here being uh, by Provenanzo et al, published this, this last year. Uh, this can be used to now cause the company's credit states and deploy strategies to take advantage of this anomaly. So considerations. So the concept of garbage in and garbage out is highly relevant here. Uh, machine learning algorithms are not magic. The, the end result depend on the user's experience posing questions that can be reliably solved by machine learning methods. It's also dependent on the richness of features given and the methodology used to tune the algorithm's parameters, thus complexity. A, a possible future direction for research, at least from the heuristic step, would be on possible improvements and additions to the volatility regime switching time varying leverage method because of its 
outstanding performance in this work. Um, here, we only, we only presented heuristic-based filtering strategies, but meta-labeling could also be used. A, a very good reference would be the book Advances in Financial Machine Learning by uh, Marcos Lopez de Prado. So the question, are machine learning methods better than classical methods? So here I'm going back to the M4 forecasting competition and taking a quote from the paper, the value added by machine learning algorithms in forecasting by Gilliland 2020. That nicely approximates the current state's state of machine learning in forecasting. So the six pure machine learning methods again, fared poorly, with all of them falling below the comp benchmark that combined three simple time series methods. However, utilizing machine learning either in combination with statistical methods or in a hybrid model with exponential smoothing not only exceeded the benchmark but performed at the top. While these promising results by no means prove machine learning to be a panacea, they do challenge the notion that complex methods do not add value to the forecasting method, to the forecasting process. Uh, thank you for your time. That's the end of my lecture. Any questions?